morning, everyone, and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and mother figures we have here this morning. It's good to see all of you and be worshiped with all of you. I invite you to stand as we begin our worship with praise music. Testament lesson comes from Acts 9, 36 through 43. Now in Joppa there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. 
All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I try to hide It was my tomb Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You call my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know The old made new Jesus, when I met you You call my name Into your glorious day, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when I was broken you were my healing now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future my eyes are open when you call my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you call my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness to your glorious day. You call my name and I ran out
out of that grave.
pray. With joy, we come this day to the house of the Lord. God provides for us abundantly, even when we doubt and fear, even when we turn away. God is faithful. Open our hearts today, O Lord, to hear your word for us, that we may become faithful disciples of our Lord all our days. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Just in case that wasn't loud enough, I'll say it again. Happy Mother's Day. We are celebrating mothers today in our church, and I want to honor and celebrate all the mothers and mother figures, as Corey put it so well today, those folks in our lives. But can we talk? Who was it? Was it Joan Rivers who used to say, can we talk? We, we, we should stop there with Joan Rivers' monologue. I've seen some of them. <laughs> but seriously, can we talk? I, I, I think we can. I think we're on good enough terms, right? I, I'm going to be honest. For a pastor celebrating Mother's Day, it can be tricky business. You all know that if I ignore this day, this special Sunday once a year, if I didn't say anything for some, it would be right next to that sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, and you'd be on the phone with the DS before you got out of the parking lot. The fact that you have the DS on your speed dial is a whole nother question. But mothers certainly are due the honor we give them. I want to honor my mother today. I want to honor... The two women in this world who were mothers, who are adopted children, who made it possible for us to be a family. There are so many mothers in our pews. You deserve a giant thank you. We know how important this is to community. We know that this means something to us. It's, there's nothing wrong with giving our moms a few props. And yet, at the same time, I know that in the past, the church has sometimes elevated this idea of motherhood, this idea of the saintly mother, and we've created this day to put women in kind of this pedestal, on a pedestal with this narrow definition that's been placed on them, a bouquet of flowers in their arms, elevated for this one day. And yet the church has also done this thing. They've, they've been complicit in creating this soft, quilted calico cage for women. Some parts of the church have even called motherhood the desire of God for every woman. Yeah, I saw some, some noses wrinkled, some, some squints, wounding folks who maybe have chosen to be childless or who may suffer from infertility, or even lost children in tragic ways. And what about those who grieve? Grieve perhaps a childhood, perhaps having a mother who wasn't the epitome of a sentimental Hallmark greeting card. Every community has these folks. And so what's a pastor to do? I think the first thing is what I just did, name it. It is okay to name things. It is okay to be honest. But the other thing that I have said to you often, and I will say it now, is trust the Spirit. 
Because that's what I want us to do. She will provide the answer. And she did today. She did for me as I was looking at our preaching choices, our lectionary texts. And I looked at our lectionary selection. And I saw the reading from Acts. Yes, I am using she, her pronouns for the Holy Spirit. But that's a conversation for another time. You have seen the shack, right? Our reading from Acts today and throughout the season of Easter are wonderful. There's this passage today where we heard this beautiful response to our demand to celebrate women today. It it offers this story of faithful women of the early church that transcends the question of whether or not they bore children. It presumes that many of them had, I would assume, especially in the ancient world. But that is not the point of the story. It is their discipleship that we focus on. And I'm, I'm grateful for the Holy Spirit's work today for another reason. It seems that she has brought together this invitation and an opportunity for me to bring you an infomercial. Yes, I want you to think about the book of Acts, and we're going to focus on it for the next few weeks in this season of Easter, our Acts readings. But our Sunday school is actually studying a book called Acts, Catching Up with the Spirit. It's by a seminary professor from Lutheran Seminary in, in, in Minneapolis. And, and I've, I've listened to podcasts by him. He's, he's a, a well-known New Testament theologian. And so when I saw that Cokesbury had produced this, this book study with him there was, with some, some accompanying videos, I suggested to our adult education group that, that you study this during Easter because... We also have, you know, Easter is the risen Christ, the the, the community going out. What a perfect opportunity. And they're loving the book. So if you want to join them, they meet upstairs. They're meeting in person now, and the, the group is getting larger and larger. And I know that they're really enjoying this opportunity to talk about the way spirit spread. But I also like how Professor Skinner, the the writer of this book that they're studying, I like how he frames the way to think about the book of Acts. First of all, he says, Acts begins with this recognition that Jesus is central to the larger story. That's always our starting point. Jesus is the center. And so Jesus commissions the disciples. He does it himself. He he says to the disciples that you will be witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We'll actually read that text in a few weeks on Ascension Sunday and and before Pentecost or after Pentecost. But all of this hinges on what God has done through Jesus Christ. It builds on this conviction, this fundamental conviction that through the incarnation through Christ coming to this world as a babe, through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, that Jesus, of Jesus, that God is doing something new. News we need to think about today. God is doing something new, brand new, bringing old promises to completion. God is sending God's spirit into the world. And so for the people who follow Jesus, I hope that, is something that we recognize. For the people that follow Jesus, who follow Jesus as their Lord, God is finally bringing about a new order of things, a new restoration, a universal restoration, founded on this understanding that God is faithful and will continue to be. We sometimes think of the book of Acts like a bit of a history class, like it's the, you know, it's the next chapter. We, we call it the next chapter very often. We know that it was written by the same author as the Gospel of Luke, and that we see parallels if we look at the, the Luke and Gospel story and then the Acts story that comes after that. Together, these two volumes create a, a single, singular narrative and that they have echoes of each other. But Professor Skinner doesn't want us to think about Acts as a history primer. He wants us to think about it as a story or a bunch of stories, a collection of stories. He doesn't say that the writers of Acts claim to tell us everything that happened in the early church. 
It just tells stories. Some of the stories are exciting and suspense-filled, thrilling. People are faithful. People are not faithful. Some of the stories are funny. But at its heart, Acts is a book that offers us a window, a glimpse into what it's like to follow God in the midst of uncertain circumstances. Good thing that only happened then, right? What does it look like to follow God in the midst of uncertain circumstances? So I think about this story here, this, this story of Tabitha, of Dorcas. They give her two names, a Greek name, and I'm presuming that Tabitha must be a Jewish name. But you can picture this story, right? You can, you can imagine, imagine a modern version of a Tabitha today. She's this beloved pillar of the church. She's a member of the wider community. And the people who loved her, they were distraught. That ever happened around here? Lost a pillar of the community. I have done way too many funerals in these last few years. We have lost too many Tabithas. And we didn't have a Peter in, 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 in Java to call out for. But these folks did. Peter was nearby, they are told. And so they send two men from the community to fetch him. He had just performed this miracle there. And surely the news of that had reached them. He had healed the paralyzed man, Aeneas, in Lydda, not far away. And so as this news makes this way to the folks in Joppa, they begin to get this idea, this beloved one that they have lost. They have already taken care of her. They've washed her body. They have laid her out. They said, Peter's not far away. So they send for him. They send for him, and that's all they do. Now remember, this isn't like in the story in the gospel where the, that father, he comes to Jesus, right? And he's begging him, Jesus, come quickly, come, my daughter is ill. Can you make it before she dies? Tabitha's already dead. She's been washed, she's been laid out in that upper room, and they just, they want Peter to come. Show up. You heard the rest. The widows showed Peter when they got them all the things, got there all the things that Tabitha had done, all the good works, all those beautiful articles of clothing that she had sewed, the fine handing work, the stitches, crying all the while. And Peter sighs, I'm sure, and waves them away, and then he goes to work. on his knees. He kneels down and he prays. There's a lesson right there. It's your first move. What does he pray for? I don't know. Perhaps he prayed for the ones who had received those lovely garments who now were missing her. Perhaps he prayed for the sake of the community that loved this woman so much and would be missing her talent. Surely he prayed for the woman lying there washed and cold and ready for whatever was next. But he prayed that the Lord's will would be done and then he stood up. I'm thinking at this point that he's probably remembering some things, right? He's probably remembering that other story, that other room, that other father, that small body that was laid out by the time that Jesus and the disciples had gotten there. He was with Jesus on that day. Surely he remembered the father and the mother and the family who begged Jesus to hurry. Their tears of disappointment because that child was dead. And then he remembered Jesus. Jesus reaching out his hand to that dead child girl. And Jesus whispering those words that we remember. Talitha kum, little girl rise. Little girl rise. 
He does the same. Peter does this very same thing. He reaches out his hand and he says to Tabitha, get up. Get up. And I imagine her eyes fluttering open and looking into his. And she sits up. And Acts even gives this detail that Peter helps her up. Get up. He is telling her, get up, Tabitha. You have work still to do. Your community needs you. You have gifts that you possess that are only yours. Get up. Get up. You being raised up is a witness to God's restoration. Get up. This is the Acts community that this story helps us see, and every one of them will. It is a community that is going about their business in ways that seem every day ordinary. And then every now and then something really extraordinary happens. The spirit moves. She moves. And we see this confidence, this faith that is hard for us to recognize today. Because sometimes it is hard for us to live in that acts kind of faithfulness. But the Spirit moves, and we are told that story, and this is why Jesus said, you are witnesses, and that we are to be those witnesses as well. They do this together. They do this in community. I hope this sounds familiar to us. I hope this reminds us of this moment that our church is going through right now, a moment when the Spirit is leading Even amidst the anxiety, even amidst the challenge, even amidst the division, even amidst the fear, the Holy Spirit is leading us. And to be Easter people, to be the Acts community, it means a joining and a celebrating of what the Spirit is doing. It means standing and believing in resurrection That the Easter lilies and all those things that we celebrated just a couple Sundays ago actually means something. But this story in particular, let's move back to Tabitha, means something specific as well. On this Sunday, on this Women's Sunday, a Sunday when we remember how important our women in ministry are. This past week, I noticed on Facebook, yeah, I know, you you got to keep up with it, right? And and Facebook actually tells me more of what I need to see than what I get to choose to see, right? Does that not drive you crazy? But I noticed that there was this meme kind of going around, especially in, you know, us those pastor groups that you're, you're a part of. And, and there was this one that, that, that kept going around that I noticed. And no, it's not about the new denomination that started last week. It was something different. It was something that was much more enlivening and much more encouraging to me. It was a posting of the celebration of May 4th. And no, not Star Wars, may the 4th be with you. But it was on May 4th. It happened before Star Wars ever came out as a movie. In fact, it happened in 1956. May the fourth be with you to all women pastors in the United Methodist Church. Yes, in 1956, the General Conference voted to affirm full rights of women as full members of the clergy. So yay, 1956. On this clergy Facebook page that I was noticing, um, Somebody I'm, I'm Facebook friends with, and he's a, he's a member of the Indiana Conference of Pastor Taylor Burton Edwards, and he's, he's formerly the, the director, director of resources for the General Board of Discipleship. When, when, you, when you go looking for worship helps, he, he, he always used to be there. He, he, he finished that job in, I think, 2018, and now another Indiana guy is doing it, Derek Weber. Uh, but, but Taylor's kind of this, this guy who he acknowledges, like, the information guru. If there's, in fact, he used to have this this blog that was um, uh, a, a, something like "Ask a Question," United Methodist Question, and he would like obscure things. He would know these things, and so we, we think like Taylor is like the expert. So this is this is how he noted that when 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 someone brought up this discussion, he said, "Prior, what happened in 1956?" Full clergy rights for women. Prior to that time, a woman could be ordained as a local deacon, 
or as a local elder. Methodists still ordained local elders at that time. That's before my time. I'm not quite sure exactly where the boundaries were on that, what that means. But, but they were not elders in full connection. What that means to be an elder in full connection, as I am, I am I'm a member of the annual conference. So, yes, if I was a local licensed pastor, my, my, my work, my responsibility would be around my appointment, appointment my local church. But I am an elder in full connection to the Indiana Conference, which is why I can be placed at any congregation throughout our annual conference. So that's what it means to be an, an elder in full connection. And so in 1956, the vote was made that women could be elders in full connection. And until that time, no woman could be appointed as a district superintendent, could serve on the board of ordained ministry, could be elected as a bishop, or any other role that required one to be an elder in full connection. Many, many women are in these roles now, but that could not happen until 1956 because of that vote. And so in... May the 4th of 1956, those rights were boosted and provisions were added that not only gave them that opportunity, that possibility, but also boosted them because of other benefits and privileges of reaching that status, of going through all the things that one takes to go through that. They are, have a guaranteed appointment and all those things still. Of course, practice doesn't always come as quickly as the desire for that practice to happen, right? There was a bit of a lag. It didn't happen the next annual, or it didn't happen the next year or the next year. The first woman to receive full clergy rights was Maud Keister Jensen, and that did happen in 1956. The first to be ordained after that in Europe was Antonia Valdar in 1958. The first female district superintendent wasn't until 1959. And it wasn't even in North America. It was a missionary in Indonesia. The first woman who actually became a district superintendent, or I'm sorry, that Indonesian bishop was 1960, or uh, that Indonesian district superintendent was not till 1967, and the first American to be a DS. Oh, that was 1967. Too many numbers here, right? It took a while, 67. I mean, 11 years later, we finally got a district superintendent that was a woman. It wasn't until 24 years later that we finally got a woman who was nominated and ele elevated to be a bishop. Marjorie Matthews. And yet some folks challenged Taylor. That was all from Taylor. Thank you, Taylor, for that nice synopsis. They point out that our history didn't begin just with the Methodist Church post coming together. He points out that our history also, remember in 1968, what happened the United Methodist Church began, we, we came together with the Evangelical United Brethren and the Methodist Church to become the United Methodist Church, which means that when we came together, all of that history is ours, it is shared. The Methodists didn't buy out the franchise of the EUB, we are all one together, that's why we are united. And so their Brethren history and Methodist history all becomes our history. And so Pastor Scott Spencer pointed out that our history, when we include our United Brethren and our Evangelical Church, has other ways that the history of women in ministry has taken place. Because the United Brethren Church approved ordination of women in 1889. But when they merged with the Evangelical Church, they were opposed to women's ordination, and so it stopped. And so the Evangelical United Brethren, the EUB, those two groups coming together, did not continue the practice of ordaining women. But Pastor Spencer also reminded that the Methodist history has its own branches of coming together. 1844, what happens? 
We've got to go back a ways here, right? The Methodist church splits over the issue of owning human beings. And the Methodist Episcopal South branched off from the Methodist Episcopal Church over a district superintendent who had been elected who married into a family whose wife, by the laws of the land, owned human beings. And so it wasn't until 1939 that those two groups came back together and we brought together the Methodist Episcopal Church and the Methodist Episcopal Church South. But another group joined in with us, the Methodist Protestant Church. We forget this smaller branch that comes back in. And this is important because the Methodist Protestant Church already included women pastors. And so when in 1939, when these groups come together, those women who were pastors from the Methodist Protestant Church were grandfathered in, but these newly rejoined churches forbade any more women's ordination until 1956. Do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see the work of the Holy Spirit that is working on all these different groups, but as we come together and as we protect our power and patriarchy and privilege, stop listening. And yet the Holy Spirit continues to say to all people, the women in ministry, get up, get up, get up. Why are we so slow to recognize the movement of the Holy Spirit? Why do we huddle in fear of what we do not know? I hope that as we go through these next few weeks, we'll pay attention to these act stories that are full of God at work in women and men, in insiders and outcasts, in upstanding pillars of the community, and even in marginal oppressed people, that the Holy Spirit doesn't care. The Holy Spirit just says, get up and work for God. Get up. Right now, friends, we are in this midst. I promised I wasn't, wouldn't talk about this new denomination. I was going to wait till next week. We... We are so fixated right that about this, this dilemma right now, and the Holy Spirit doesn't care. The Holy Spirit is saying, get out of your doors and go to work. Why are our churches and our communities and our denomination offices and agencies paralyzed in fear? We only need to look at Acts and at the Acts community to be reminded that everybody is trying to live into new realities the ways that God is speaking to them, trying to understand them, to interpret them. And the Holy Spirit is always bringing new people into our midst. And so our task is to work to find new ways to live together, to struggle together, to adapt to new circumstances. This is like the church today. We are living into a future that we cannot predict. We have traditions, we have beliefs. And sometimes they help us and sometimes they don't. We don't know what the future will bring. But Acts reminds us that when we step forward into that future, God will be there. God will remain faithful. God will continue to help the church adapt to these new circumstances, to new ways of worshiping, new ways of living with God and one another. But it's only possible if we see that God is a God with an ever-expanding call, a call to discipleship, a call to community, the community never gets smaller, it gets larger. More are brought in, and those who are here have been doing good work all along and are needed still. God calls everyone. And so on this day, I want to thank the women of the United Methodist Church Women united in faith, you have answered the call. Thank you. Thank you for the good work that you do. Thank you for responding to the Holy Spirit in your homes and schools and churches, your work in neighborhoods and hospitals and universities and business offices, in art studios and music venues, in government buildings and nonprofits, in dorms and restaurants and retail stores and farms and factories and laboratories, and yes, even in the pulpit. Thank you, thank you, thank you.
Thank you, thank you. I remembered farms just for you. You are needed. You are valued. You are worthy and gifted and talented and living lives of discipleship that is a witness for God. You are the Acts community. You are Easter people. So to you and to all of us, get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Holy God, as Peter once did for Tabitha, we now also pray for healing. Healing for the people who find themselves caught in the middle of a war. Healing for the political divisions that seem to deepen every day. Healing from injury and illness for those in our community and those beyond it. Healing for the church as it reshapes itself to be more in line with your will. God, you work wonders beyond our imagination, and we thank you for all the faithful people you have inspired in the history of the church. You have sent into our lives kind Christians who have encouraged us in beautiful ways. Help us to keep growing as disciples led by your spirit. May we become more devoted to good works and acts of charity so that others will be blessed in turn. And Father, we pray now together that prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, now is our time of generosity and peace, and as Dwayne so uh, eloquently put it, thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you do, not just the women, but the men too. We as a community do a lot of good work. So thank you for all you do in your time, in your offerings, in the ways that you serve this community. And if you are eager to serve this community and you don't know how, ask Dwayne or I. We would be happy to connect you with a ministry that you'd be interested in. If you want to start a new ministry, we would be happy to support that as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I invite you to take a moment now to stand and greet each other in the peace of Christ and take a moment to wave to our cameras if you haven't yet today and greet the people worshiping with us at home. The peace of Christ be with you. And I invite you to remain standing as we close with a praise song. So
look at this story, I look at this story that I really hadn't paid attention to, that, that 1956 date was stuck in my mind, and until we paid attention to this, I really didn't think about the parallels to the struggles that we're going through right now. We talk about the cons concern we have with inclusion, and we say, you know, since 1972, our denomination has been struggling with what inclusion looks like. And then I look at this story, and I say, wait a minute, 1889? to 1956. That's a long time to struggle, and yet the Spirit did not stop working. And so no matter how long it takes for us to be that better acts community, the Spirit will work on us if we will only get up and go. Get up. Go. Go.